Welcome to our panel on corruption and women <clears throat> lessons for the Caribbean. Today we'll be exploring the gender specific forms of corruption. My name is Jessica Harris and I am a gender specialist within the social sector division at CDB. Today, our panelists will be sharing some gendered approaches to anti-corruption that could inform how we empower people to take action to combat corruption in the Caribbean. Corruption delays efforts in the countries and in citizens to achieve higher levels of human development and to reduce inequalities, including gender. Gender aspects influence and shape cultures across the world and feature in diverse areas of our lives. Corruption affects persons differently across the world. In many societies, women remain the primary caretakers of the family and are regularly confronted with corruption when dealing with education, health, and other public services. Patronage networks that are often dominated by men exclude women from participating in or access to public and private sectors, as well as the political sphere. While there is some empirical and theor theoretical research exploring the dimensions of gender and corruption, mainstreaming gender and anti-corruption programming remains the exception and not the rule. Persons experience corruption in unique and specific ways. In all sectors of women's daily experiences, there is patriarchal power that can expose vulnerable women to corruption. Power, money, and privilege are part of the male domain that enable corruption to be definite dimension of gender inequality. This is especially true for women, men, persons who identify as LGBT, and persons who experience compounded marginalization as Indigenous, elderly, ill, or disabled, and persons who are migrants, refugees, or displaced. Poverty absolutely increases persons' susceptibility to corruption. And women are often experiencing corruption, um, demands for sexual favors in exchange for money or work benefits. Corruption facilitates criminal enterprises such as drug dealing, money laundering, human trafficking and prostitution, illegal commodities and more. Existing social, economic, political, legal, and gender inequalities make women and other vulnerable groups especially vulnerable to the consequences of corruption. Corruption hampers the implementation of the 12 critical areas of concern formulated within the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Today, we will highlight some areas that will require the attention of policymakers to generate preventative anti-corruption policies, and at the same time, diminish the gender bias. This panel will consider tools and good practices for persons to be alert to corruption and deal with corruption. We hope to inspire action today for those affected by corruption, offer methods to dismantle gendered corruption, and propose actions to address the multifaceted effects corruption has on persons, families, and communities. We hope to encourage a robust discussion as a platform of exchange for participants as a means to interact with peers to tackle corruption. I will now introduce the panelists. We have with us today, Luciana Torquiaro, and she's the Regional Advisor for Latin America and the Caribbean at Transparency International Secretariat in Berlin but Transparency International also has chapters in Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Guyana, and the Dominican Republic. She leads the regional work that includes an initiative on gender and corruption. And also she's a member of Transparency International Secretariat's working group on gender. Luciana holds a degree in political science from the University of Buenos Aires and a master's in international studies from the Universidad Torquiato Di Tela. She was awarded with a fellowship by the Ford Foundation to conduct research on regional security affairs. Welcome, Luciana. I'd like to introduce Kristen Sample, who has over 20 years of experience in democratic governance programming and research. 
Since early 2020, she is the director of the National Democratic Institute's NDI Democratic Governance Team with oversight for global coordination and thought leadership on anti-corruption and governance reform and strengthening. From 2012 to 2014, Kristen served also as director of the global programs for the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. She has published extensively on issues related to anti-corruption, accountability, and democratic delivery, citizen security, political representation, and gender. Welcome, Kristen. So I wanted to start um, the conversation with a question directed towards Kristen. Um, you know, there's this age old debate on whether women are less corrupt than men. Um, what does the evidence tell us, Kristen? So much, just for um, this invitation or for moderating. It's such a pleasure to join you and Luciana in this conversation and, and really appreciate the invitation from the Caribbean Development Bank. Um, uh, it's the second year that I've had the pleasure of joining and, and speaking on this panel, and it's such an important topic, and I really salute the bank's interest in highlighting the connections between corruption and gender. So as you say, um, Jessica, it's such a, it's kind of an age old question. Are women really the fairer sex, right? Are, are women less corrupt than men? Um, in NDI, you know, we focus on democratic participation. So we look a lot at the question of um, women's participation in politics, in public life, in, in government, and is there an impact there um, in terms of levels of corruption? And I'd really say that the evidence is mixed. Um, there was some early research that seemed to point to a correlation between higher levels of women in, in politics and lower levels of corruption, but those findings haven't really been uh, replicated. And, and I think that the emerging consensus is that to the extent that there's a correlation between gender and corruption, it really is very context dependent, right? It's linked to that complex interplay with institutional factors and gender socialization. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples, there's some research that shows, for instance, that um, there might be a correlation between women in politics and lower levels of corruption in, in democracies, but not so much in authoritarian countries. And that's because um, women as a disadvantaged group have a stronger um, incentive or self-interest to adhere to norms, right? And so de since democracies are associated with um, more um, social norms around anti-corruption, women might be more likely than to be less corrupt than men, again, in these in these specific contexts. I think another really interesting stream is that, you know, we know that women are, are marginalized in many different contexts and sectors, and that seems to even apply to corruption, um, that we're sidelined, we're marginalized, we're excluded, we're discriminated against. Um, you know, corruption often depends more on exposure I think then women's essential intrinsic nature. And so to the extent that women are less corrupt, it could be a reflection of the fact that they're largely excluded from corrupt networks, that they don't have equal opportunities when it comes, I'm saying this a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's true that women don't necessarily have the same access or equal opportunity when it comes to engaging in corrupt activities. In Peru, for instance, there was a, an initiative some years back to, there was so much corruption in the transit police to revamp, to, to, to get rid of all the men in the police force and replace them with women transit police officers. And there was an impact. There was less um, systemic bribery uh, in the system, but many people think that was more a, a matter of the disruption of breaking up a well-established network of male traffic police rather than any, again, inherent nature of women. And I do remember just an anecdote that some years back speaking with a Peruvian politician and he said, well, of course, you know, with women police officers, there's less corruption. He says, I could never offer a bribe to a woman. It was kind of, again, this, this sense of a gender norm, a socialization, how machismo applied even in the, the corruption sphere. And just the last thing I'd say on that is, I think it's also worth it to, to kind of turn the question on its head. Um, it's not so much that more women in public life leads to less corruption. It's um, rather a matter that um, corruption leads to less women in public life. That is in, in societies and in contexts, in, in bureaus and in ministries where there's more presence of corruption, that tends to limit 
the ability of women to access those positions or to break into politics. Um, so again, I, I would say, I think maybe the takeaway is that um, are women less corrupt than men? Um, to the extent that they are, it's much more rooted, I believe, in kind of context, in networks, in access, in socialization, more than, again, any sort of intrinsic or essentialist um, behavior. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Kristen. Yeah, so really highlighting how, you know, women don't tend to have equal opportunities and access um, in engaging in, in corrupt um, activities. So corruption and maybe women's access to public and, and political life. So, um, you know, that a corruption can prevent women from getting into high level posts and, and politics and, 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 um, and business. So I, I, this leads me to my, my second question is, um, does corruption affect women and men differently? And if so, in what ways are the impacts of corruption gendered? So I guess essentially how much is the phenomenon of corruption affected um, by gender? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, similarly, the same issue of disparities also applies when we're addressing the question that you raised in terms of what are some of the, the gender differences, right? How, how are impacts differentiated for women and men? I mean, you know, let's start headline, corruption is bad for the whole of society but it does, all the evidence indicates that it does hit women particularly hard. Why is that? First of all, just generally, the effects of corruption strike the poor disproportionately, and women are particularly affected due to their higher rates of poverty and the responsibility that they have for family care. I think that's particularly acute in terms of what's termed as needs-based corruption, where bribes are linked to basic services such as education, water, sanitation, and the cost of those bribes and that corruption falls hardest on those who can least afford them, which often might be, for instance, uh, a female-led household, for instance, um, again, due to the higher rates of, of women's poverty um, generally around the world. I think another factor is that, you know, corruption in the public sector is prevalent. Um, you know, in one research project in Latin America said that up to 20% of respondents had, um, who would use healthcare had had to pay bribes, right? And that's often gendered. And uh, in some cases, you know, women's greater dependence on the public health system, particularly during their reproductive years, leaves them more vulnerable to corruption in that sector. I think, you know, also to the extent that corruption takes away resources, from public services, women suffer more um, from the consequent reductions in quality and quantity. Um, corruption leads to reduced public expenditures, leads to austerity that relates to education and health, again, which impact women uh, disproportionately. Another area of difference, I think, that's important to keep in, in mind is that in most countries around the women around the world, women have higher rates of participation in the informal sector, um, and that affects their vulnerability levels. For instance, there was a project, uh, a survey in Uganda that showed that 43% of women business owners reported harassment, such as that they would their business would be closed down, or there were demands for bribes, or illegally collected taxes. Um, by corrupt officials compared to 25% of businesses overall. So that informal sector, I think, is also more vulnerable to corruption. Um, I think also women might be um, at a greater vulnerability um, in the justice sector. You know, the, it plays out in the case of corrupt judiciaries. Um, when women lack resources, their civil rights may go unprotected um, and for processes. Uh, in the courts related to marriage, divorce, child custody, land rights, um, personal security, or bribes into law enforcement might protect the perpetrators of, of acts, criminal acts against women, including um, domestic violence. Um, so again, in the court, in the courts, there's a very um, important correlation there, a very important connection to look at that's certainly gendered. Um, and then there's the whole field, of course, of, of sextortion that I know Lucienne is going to talk about, so I won't speak to that. I do think that, again, in NDI, we focus a lot on political participation, and there is um, sextortion um, also include, uh, includes that political sphere, and it's a form of violence as well against um, political women that I think needs to be taken into account. But anyway, I would leave it up to Luciana to, to expand on this point because TI has done such fantastic work in raising awareness when it comes to sextortion specifically. 
Thank you. Thank you for bringing us to our next question, which I will address to Luciana. So how you highlighted that there are also gender specific forms of corruption, which are disproportionately experienced by women, um, such as sextortion. So Luciana, um, can you, can you um, better, def can you define for us extortion? Because um, the concept, it may be unclear for, for some persons. So what is sextortion? And what is the difference between sextortion and say sexual abuse? Thank you. Um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you, you are. Thank you very much for inviting Transparency International and myself to participate in this important session of, of this conference. Um, I'm very happy and very passionate about this topic, so thank you very much. And well, going to your question. First, it's a very simple but important question because there we hear about sextortion many times, but people confuse it either with sexual abuse or with other sorts of, of corruption. So basically what it is, is a type of corruption in which sex instead of money is the currency of the bribe. So this means that extortion has two main components, a sexual, a sexual activity on the one hand, and on the other hand, corruption. The person that demands uh, the sexual activity must occupy a position of authority. And if we want to um, distinguish extortion from other kinds of abuses, uh, we have to consider three conditions. On the one hand, there must be an abuse of authority. The perpetrator uses its power to demand uh, for the sexual activity. There also has to be an exchange. The sexual favor is in exchange of a benefit that only the perpetrator is able to provide. And the third element is coercion. Uh, it is it's extortion is not about um, physical violence, but it's rather the psychological co coercion that the person in power can a perpetrate to the victim. So to be even more concrete, for example, if a teacher um, asks a student, a girl, for a sexual favor to pass a test, then we would be uh, in a case of sextortion. If a migrant officer demands a sexual favor to allow an illegal immigrant to cross the border, that is also a typical case of, of sextortion. And definitely, building on what was said before, um, sextortion affects um, women and girls in particular because of the position they have in society. Usually, as we know in this in the patriarchal world we live in, um, men are the ones that have uh, positions of, of power. On the other hand, as Kristen was saying before, women interact more often with public authorities due to their role in society. They are the ones that have that take care of children, that are more exposed to interaction continuously, so they are more vulnerable to petty corruption and to sextortion, of course. And last but not least, uh, women possess less resources, usually um, not, they, they don't have control, or sometimes they don't have control of, of financial assets, and when they don't have cash, what can they offer? They offer sex, or a sexual favor. Um, and definitely the COVID-19, some reflections on that have put women in a more, more vulnerable situation. Uh, the quarantines, they are more, they, they have lost jobs, they, have, they are the ones that take care of children, putting their financial uh, independence at risk and making them even more vulnerable to, to, to crimes, to abuses like extortion. Um, and just one last comment that sextortion does not only uh, affect or impact on, on women and girls, but also on LGBTQ communities. Uh, we don't tend to, well, there's not enough, enough research on how, how it affects uh, these communities, but definitely uh, they are vulnerable, they are marginalized groups that uh, often um, are victims of, of of this of extortions, especially when interacting with, with the police or even by public officials that um, even LGBTQ people that 
are, are abused by public officials that are uh, that um, ask them for a sexual favor or a sexual act uh, by threatening them of revealing their sexual identity. So there is some evidence in Latin America that this it happens as well. Thank you so much, Luciana, for providing the definition and some concrete examples from, from the, the region to illustrate um, the concept, how you mentioned the schools and the borders. And also thank you for highlighting, um, you know, that the, the, main, the main survivors, you know, are um, including the elements of intersectionality in other communities. So I want to ask you, um, you know, do we have any data that you could share with us on sextortion for countries um, in, the, in this region, in the Caribbean? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> there is some data. Uh, before going to, to the data specifically, uh, it's important to know that this field of, of work, the, the work on sextortion and on, on, on the impact that corruption has on gender is very new. So there, we don't have a full picture on it, but we have some evidence that suggests that sextortion happens, that it's a problem everywhere in all countries, and definitely we need to to dig more into that. But let me show you, let me um, bring some information to you, mm -hmm. to the audience. Um, okay, so according to the uh, Global Corruption Barometer of Transparency International, which is a big, a big survey that we have, one in five people experience extortion or know someone that has suffered from extortion in Latin America and the Caribbean. In the Caribbean region, um, um, the information I can share with you is the following. My kids, uh, talking about gender, my kids. Are okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry. worry for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, in this survey, uh, we have asked uh, people whether they have experienced extortion or know someone that did. That did. And the highest rates in Latin America and the Caribbean are from Barbados with a 30%, the Bahamas with a 24%, and Guatemala with a 23%. At the bottom, we have Chile, Panama, and El Salvador. So this is what we know um, so far. It's not much. We have only asked questions on how extortion impacts uh, women. Um, it is important to highlight as well that it is very difficult to talk about this when you when someone when you on, on a survey so yes. everything could indicate that a uh, the problem the crime happens much more often so from the, what we could capture but at least this is a good starting point to to understand the problem and raise awareness about it thank you so much um, and why why is it often said that sextortion is is an invisible form of of corruption? I guess you 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 kind of mentioned it there in terms of lack of data. Um, but could you elaborate a little bit more? Sure, happy to do it. Yeah, definitely the lack of data, quantitative and qualitative, it is a problem. We don't have that, and research has started. We started at TEI five years ago with this, and we are, I believe, leading on the production of, of, of information on this. So there's not much, and we need to do much more. On the other hand, an important problem is that sextortion is not legally recognized in almost any country of the world. So if you want to uh, prosecute a case of, of sextortion, usually what happens is that uh, prosecutors uh, use laws that are related to gender violence, that they are not adequate uh, for this uh, problematic. Uh, and another element is that uh, sextortion goes really unreported. And why? Well, first, it is very difficult to report corruption. There's, in, there's fear of social stigma, retaliation, shame. In Latin America and the Caribbean, we don't have a protection. Whistleblowing protections is, 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 is one of the deficits we have in our region. So people don't feel safe about reporting this. And obviously, the, the, the sexual component makes it, makes it more difficult. Yeah. 
And mm -hmm. on the other hand, there's fear of retaliation. And then I, I finish with this. Mm -hmm. um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, 70% of the people consider they will face retaliation with reporting corruption. So if we add the sexual component, let's imagine how difficult uh, or how people might feel by reporting um, uh, sextortion. Okay. And and so what what do you think governments can do to address sextortion and and encourage the reporting? You mentioned that um, first to be legally recognized um, that the definition of you know it that it's not um, adequately. Um, defined or recognize uh, anything else that governments can do to address this this problem yeah i would say two things and, and one i think it's a takeaway um that it's re it's something that is very important we yeah. can't um we can't talk about these issues without talking to the communities so it is important for governments to talk to the victims to talk to the affected people or to the potential victims to find out what their thoughts are. In, in, in some circles in Latin America, where anti-corruption activists are working with, um, with women organizations, they have, they have a say that is nothing, with, nothing on us without us. So yes. I think that is very important. Secondly, it, is, as the, as it, will, it will take some time until uh, we have a, a, recognition, a legal recognition of extortion. So what governments can do is to include the gender is, is to include gender sensitive reporting mechanisms. Um, and by that, just to give you some ideas, um, it is important sometimes when you people go to report corruption or, or extortion in this case, it's very cold atmosphere. People are afraid of it. So it's important that these mechanisms um, uh, have an approach that focuses on the victims, that consider that the victim is a woman, uh, that has some intersectionality elements, that they are not the same. It is important to use inclusive language, uh, use language that cannot be perceived as discriminatory. Um, also, it is it's people. It is proven that people speak speak up when they feel comfortable uh, for example if the, if the public official that is there is, is a female person or a person that belongs to the gt gtbq communities to to gain more more confidence and obviously also in this world in this online world we live in online platforms are also proven to be a good way to to encourage um, um reporting and definitely there's a lot to be done in terms of uh, creating awareness uh, among public officials and prosecutors about the topic. So these are just some ideas. Uh, we can later um, discuss further if there's appetite. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, it definitely a, a takeaway for me is the the importance of awareness raising on the differential gender impact of corruption. Um, so we all need to become more aware to understand um, to understand better the gendered impact um, and really better address um, the specific concerns and experiences of different different vulnerable groups. Um, so I want to go back to to Kristen and just kind of. Um, build on 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 the gender um specific forms of corruption um do you do you think that women in in public life face higher levels of online threats and harassment than their male counterparts um and and if this is true for politicians is it also true for women anti-corruption activists or whistleblowers um over to you, Kristen, and your thoughts. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Jessica. I think it is a good issue to raise, kind of like sextortion. It's um, emerging, um, it's still underexplored, um, but it's certainly quite impactful. I mean, we know that violence against women online is it's pervasive, it's persistent. Um, evidence indicates that women politicians and women in public life face greater proportions of harassment and disinformation online than their male counterparts, and that that abuse manifests itself 
in different forms and the types of harassment that men received. You know, it's it's much more, you know, about it's sexualized. It's about body shaming. Uh, it's sexual harassment, trolling. Um, you know, it's just really vile, <laughs> sexualized insults that men in public life don't um, don't have to face in the same way. Um, it, it's very much underpinned by by misogyny. Um, whereas men, maybe they're um, the types of trolling that they might get is more about their ability to lead. Again, women, it's much more at her gender identity um, and and threats, you know, sexual threats, defamation, um, character assassination that is, I think, very specific to women. Um, and NDI in our research on this, we found that that online violence has a chilling effect on women. It, it leads in many cases, politically active women to uh, slow down, to pause, or to altogether stop their social media presence. Um, and I would say that there is at least ample anecdotal evidence that suggests that anti-corruption activists and whistleblowers are similarly subject to abuse that's disproportionate in terms of the levels and the vitriol that they have to, to deal with. Um, Amnesty International has published uh, on this. They've cataloged, cataloged, cataloged the experiences of women's rights activists and and seeing that these women's rights activists and, and anti-corruption activists tend to be targets given their, their position of calling out injustices. And just to give one very timely example, I would, I would point to Maria Ressa, who's a leading journalist. She's an activist. She's you know written so much and her, her organization Rappler has really come out with all kinds of amazing research on um, corruption abuses in the Philippines. She's also a Nobel Prize <laughs> laureate as well. But she's faced tremendous violence online um, and online attacks that were used to undermine her professional credibility. And 35 percent of those personal attacks were misogynistic, sexist, explicit, um, again, very, very much focused on her on her gender identity. Um, and just to kind of close on this, you know, it's very damaging. It, it's truly scary, sort of these figures, these instances, these examples. But there are steps that I think can be taken to address online violence. Uh, NDI has developed um, guidance um, on this issue. Um, and I think that a, an organization like the Caribbean Development Bank, for instance, um, which has specific institutional and programmatic responsibilities, you know, could take some actions and maybe some kind of takeaways would be what what can we do about this terrible, terrible thing? One is to try to integrate, um, you know, training uh, into programs on how one can protect their personal information, how they can mitigate psychological trauma from this online disinformation, um, work with human resources on policies that support women um, that are subject to gender-based abuse and disinformation, keep um, databases of the abuse in the reports against women employees and affiliates, you know, share those with platforms, um, invest in training on sort of what are some of the um, channels for reporting or, or, or platform moderation tools for partners who may be subject to this sort of these sorts of gendered attacks? Um, build awareness to deter uh, gender disinformation. And finally, you know, build broader awareness, you know, work with your partners across the Caribbean um, on uh, what this type of gender based disinformation campaign is. We shouldn't just accept it as normal or just sort of the way that things are. We need to point out how it's unjust, it's unfair, it's um, you know, discriminatory, and it, it has that chilling effect again, so that a woman might be less likely to report corruption or, or blow the whistle or to engage in these sorts of um, good governance activities, integrity promotion, um, because of, again, the types of attacks and onslaughts that they see other women face. So I think to raise awareness and sort of solidarity around these issues and, and have safe reporting channels is, is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for that. Um, many good um, suggestions and actions that, that we, can, we can all consider. Um, really, I think, again, what came out was the, the importance of, of, of building societal awareness on gender-based disinformation and, and how, you know, campaigns are, are needed, um, including um, in the media so that individuals might um, avoid engaging in or amplifying such, such campaigns in the future. I think training on platform reporting as well, like you said, is, is also very important. Um, 
so we have about uh, 20 minutes left. So I'm wondering if uh, the audience, we wanted to have a question and answer period. If there's any questions from the audience, I would like to open up uh, to the audience with any specific questions. And if not, I have a couple other questions, but let me just see if we have any questions from our audience here. Okay. Um, so in a, in a male dominated political establishment and government, women who stand up against corruption are victimized and marginalized, which international agencies can we turn to for support? And this is uh, one of our first audience questions. Does Kristen or Luciana want to take that one? I can say something. Yes, please. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I can speak on Transparency International. And so what I can say is that as I said before, it is very difficult to go to a public office and, and, and report extortion or corruption. An alternative that we have is, uh, is to go to NGOs. Sometimes they offer safer channels where people feel more comfortable and, and, and confident to speak up. Uh, at Transparency International, we have our advocacy and legal advice centers. These are centers that provide um, victims and, and witnesses of corruption um, with um, assessment with um, with support on how to how to proceed if there is a case of corruption or extortion um, in the caribbean region we have a center in trinidad and tobago and one in jamaica uh, led by uh, the international the national integrity action nia i mentioned the name because it is very famous in the caribbean uh, work. So this is an alternative, uh, and also uh, I am sure that uh, the NGOs from the women movement have also um, these kind of mechanisms in place. So this is an alternative at least. Thanks, Luciana. I'm wondering, can you share any resources or maybe links in the that we can make sure that we share that with our audience? Um, and the next question we have here is we witness in government and government agencies um, corrupt males collaborate with each other to isolate women known for their um, integrity from work opportunities. Where where can we seek help? I think we might have lost Lucy. Was, oh, did we lose her? Oh, dear. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, while we're waiting, I'll, I'll just take a step. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's any easy answer. I do think that it's context dependent. Luciana mentioned, you know, going to NGOs, um, either good governance NGOs or women's organizations. Um, you know, sometimes those are separate groups and they might be in their own silos. So I think that the person who's trying to deal with this uh, challenge uh, has to decide where they have the most level of trust. Sometimes also in countries, there might be an ombuds um, in person, ombuds person um, office where I know um, uh, in many of the countries where I've worked, it's a important resource for people to go uh, to report abuse as yeah. well. And um, also the gender machineries in countries usually have a support and referral center that persons can go to as well. Absolutely. That's a great point, Jessica, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we lost Luciana there, but um, maybe I will go back to um, another question for you, Kristen. Um, really, um, you know, in our COVID-19 kind of context, um, has COVID-19 worsened the gender disparities? Um, if you could... Um, if you could, uh, in our COVID-19 context, if you could highlight um, if the gender disparities have, have worsened. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the answer is a resounding and unfortunate yes. Um, you know, in emergency contexts, you know, such as COVID, um, all of the sorts of disparities that we've talked about, I think, become even more acute and dire. Um, you know, 
we're all still living it, right? As schools, for instance, COVID, schools shut down, the care burden for the sick and the children, you know, it falls on, on whose shoulders? It falls on the shoulders of women and girls. Um, girls are more likely to have their education curtailed in these situations, I think, than, than boy and children. And these can have life-changing impacts um, on, um, on women and girls. Um, the, the movement restrictions that we continue, you know, maybe aren't quite as much as they were in the start, but still continue to try to live with um, hit in multiple ways. Women face, I think, increased levels of domestic and intimate partner violence at home. They might be harassed, abused, assaulted by security agents. Um, the diversion of police resources to the responses to disease also leave women without state protection um, that they're entitled to. Um, and then just on the economic side, uh, there's ample research and um, data that shows that women, um, you know, across the world have lost jobs at higher proportions than men, suffered more financial loss, um, and again, taken on increased burden of unpaid care and domestic work um, that I think is very impactful. Um, also, you know, this is, we've talked about intersectionality. Of course, this is even more acute for women from um, more disadvantaged social economic classes or from uh, ethnic, uh, religious, uh, gender identity groups that are, that are marginalized. Um, I think what we know about shocks like pandemics, conflict, and I think let's get you know ready for it as well, climate change, um, all these sorts of disasters is that the the political space shrinks and women are more marginalized as well in decision-making processes because many times in a disaster, decisions have to be made quickly. There has to be a rapid response uh, capacity and the casualty of that would be uh, more inclusion, a better understanding of the differentiated needs of men and women, more participation or voice for women. So I think it's really imperative in these crises. And again, with climate change, we're only going to have more and more and more, sadly, of these types of situations that we need to have systems in place, whether it's a development bank, a government, a, a nonprofit organization, systems in, pay, in place that we can act nimbly, uh, agile in an agile fashion, but also in a way that is, you know, um, pre-positioning, inclusion, consultation, uh, gender differentiation. Yeah, and I and I think all of this is made worse um, by the failure of many countries to promote gender responsive measures in response to the, to the pandemic. Um, and I wanted to ask you um, one last question: What are the areas um, that you think that require attention of decision makers to create public policies that simultaneously prevent? corruption and reduce gender bias. Do you want me to take that or Luciana first? Oh, okay, Luciana's back. Yep. <laughs> oh, back, Luciana. <laughs> um, do you wanna take it first, Luciana or Kristen? I let Kristen first. Okay, sure, no problem. Sure, I mean, you know, thinking especially maybe about the types of activities and projects that are supported by a development bank, you know, a couple of ideas come to mind. First of all, um, you know, recognizing the development banks often provide support to countries for budget analysis. I think it's really important to show that these are gender responsive budget analysis processes with a very clear understanding of the differentiated impacts that budgets have on women and men. Um, yeah. I think the issue we talked about or, or, or another issue that's relevant when we talk about differentiated gender impacts, one is, is procurement processes. Women might have less access to participate to compete in procurement processes because they're shut out of networks, right? So I yeah. think that, you know, procurement processes, building in um, very inclusive um, outreach, uh, promotion, even uh, gender-based set-asides, as we've seen in some countries, can also help break up corrupt networks and help women break into procurement processes. You know, complaint systems, of course, which get at some of the issues that Luciana raised on sex extortion, but more generally, you know, building complaint systems into projects, all of your projects, because corruption can happen in any sort of a project, you know, would include sex disaggregated tracking of complaints, resolutions to ensure that women can really take advantage of those processes. Information needs to be disseminated through channels that women can access. Um, and then, you know, obviously the issue of data that was mentioned as it relates to sex, sex extortion, but I think really all projects you know, for a development bank, for instance, should have sex disaggregated data so that 
were able to understand any differences in terms of the needs and the interests of men and women. I guess the last point I would just mention briefly too is the, the area of open government. This is an area that we work at in a lot in um, NDI. Next week is the 10th anniversary summit, in fact, of the Open Government Partnership. I know Jamaica at least uh, is a member country of OGP, but you don't have to be an OGP member to work on open government. And I know that a lot of development banks support open government initiatives. And that's an area too, where I think we need to do more research and understanding of how open government approaches affect women, how they can help women, um, you know, how, again, we're building an open government data that's gender disaggregated, um, how we're engaging with women on, you know, sort of the overhauls of systems when we're trying to make um, governments more open and more transparent. And we're mainstreaming commitments for gender analysis and the design of open government systems. Um, you know, geo mapping of projects, for instance, that include gender analysis and an equal participation of men and women, I think is important. And then the last would just be, you know, there's a big push in many countries of Latin America for digitalization, simplification of administrative processes to mm -hmm. um, fight corruption. And that's something too, where we would need to make sure that women have access and are able to engage in digitalization, in e-government, that that's not shutting them out, but that's something where they're able to engage equally. So I think, you know, open government transparency is really important for integrity and anti-corruption, but we need to make sure that those new systems are, are appropriate also to the needs and to the assets or the um, levels of engagement of women. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Luciana, do you have anything to add? Yeah, suggest? well, Crystal was very, <laughs> wow, she was great, but I just know. <laughs> a, a couple of points, uh, or just to strengthen some of them, research, yeah. research, yeah. we need more information, especially in this part of the world, there is, mm -hmm. I mean, the Caribbean region is behind the rest, the Latin America, for example, and other parts mm -hmm. of the world in terms of information, so a development bank could really help mm -hmm. in creating more, more information to understand the, the gender, the intersectionality dimension, and also other issues. On the one, on the other hand, we need to build capacity of public officials. They have to understand uh, the intersection between corruption and, and, and gender issues. Extortion is one of them, but there are many, many. We need yeah. to build capacity on that. And third, I think that the, a, a development bank like this one could be also a convener of, of the two communities, of the anti-corruption community and the gender community, and create an enabling environment to discuss these topics and to actually implement uh, all these um, ideas that we are discussing here today and that Kristen put out so well. So just some ideas. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, for really highlighting the need um, to generate information, strength and capacity for citizens, and I would say especially for women and vulnerable groups, um, so they know their rights and how to exercise them. Um, you mentioned um, creating and strengthening permanent accountability mechanisms and spaces um, for authorities to account um, to citizens for their actions and decisions. Um, I think you mentioned also facilitating spaces and channels where citizens can file complaints on corruption freely and openly uh, with no risk of retaliation. Um, so with whistleblower protection, paying close attention to gender bias that may affect one's willingness to file a complaint. Um, also establishing effective controls to prevent petty corruption. Um, strengthening st statistical systems and analysis tools because without specific and reliable data uh, it is difficult to make accurate assessment of the situation um, and to design appropriate um, policies and to control efficiently uh, policy implementation um, so really i think one of my main takeaways is the significant deficit um, and statistical systems um, and issues related um, to, to, to gender and corruption. And so I just want to, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to give Luciana and Kristen a chance. Um, are there any 
Um, for the audience, uh, if you want to highlight in 20 seconds, maybe the main takeaways or the most important points um, from this important, uh, very rich discussion today. Oh, Kristen, did you want to start? Yeah, I mean, thank you. It's so hard to figure out what to do. <laughs> <laughs> been wide ranging and such a, you know, I've been so much enjoyed the exchange with you and Jessica and Luciana. I mean, I guess that I would just say that um, it's really an issue. You know, we talk about this, I think, gender for decades now is, you know, making sure that the gender analysis, the gender assessment, the gender planning, the gender budgeting is mainstreamed throughout all of the activities that the um, bank does, for instance, or government does, because any activity is vulnerable to corruption. And so um, you need to have that gender differentiated, gender specific, gender intentional um, analysis and planning built into to any sort of activity to take into account how women are going to be affected differently by the project or by the risks of corruption. Um, the data that um, Luciana mentioned, that sort of um, research and data, I think is, is particularly important. Um, you know, and the intersectionality point that we've raised as well, it's not just looking at women in as a monolithic group, but it's really digging down much more and packing that much more to understand all the different disparities um, that um, can affect different types of women differently, which I think is really crucial. Um, and again, I think that there are some areas like extortion and like um, online violence against uh, women that are emerging that uh, require more uh, information and, uh, you know, places where um, the Caribbean Development Bank could really make a difference, you know, highlighting, elevating, showcasing these issues and piloting new and innovative approaches, approaches I think, would be most, most welcome. Thank you for highlighting those two critical areas. Um, and Luciana, any last words? Uh, yeah, well, definitely there's a huge need to include in anti-corruption policy design and implementation the angle of gender. This is not only a problem in this part of the world, but it's it's a need. Uh, let's not forget that women, we are 51% of the population uh, in the yeah. world. So we need the angle of this huge group of people on this. So just again, it is very important that I mean, the, this. I'm sure that the audience here belongs more uh, to the anti-corruption community. It is very important to start talking to the gender and the women uh, movement to understand their needs. That's something I said before, but I want to strengthen that point. We can't do this alone. On the other hand, the, the element of information is critical, as, as we have highlighted during this great conversation. And also, it is important that to, to consider the element of uh, reporting mechanisms in the context of the Caribbean region. Many countries are very small, and it is even more difficult to report in a context where everybody knows everybody. So this is also an important element that might be uh, important to keep an eye on for specifically the, the audience that is here. So. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luciana. And I think for me, my my last takeaway to address um, the gender dimensions of corruption, we, we should acknowledge that an inclusive society is a less corrupt society and gender equality and anti-corruption policies are, are mutually reinforcing. And that there really there is no one size fits all when when crafting gender responsive anti corruption measures, but uh, I think as mentioned, civil society has an important role to play to ensure outreach and awareness raising and and multilateral banks as well in order to ensure that gender uh, is an agent for change in the fight against corruption. So I really want to thank uh, our panelists for um, all their insights. Um, and I wanna the, uh, thank the audience as well for their participation and their questions. And I, I look forward to hopefully uh, engaging more and, and as you mentioned, um, you know, actually identifying some concrete actions that we could all um, do together to move 
to, to address these uh, critical areas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.